There are people that talk about the, the, a light. There are people that talk about floating above. There are people that talk about a feeling of warmth and love. I didn't feel any of that. I felt none of that. I felt untold terror. When I came to, Dr. Allen said my hair was literally standing on the end. It was an incredible experience to see that there is life uh, beyond life. Everyday people like you and me, living their lives one minute and the next they lay dying, having never known or believed the message of salvation. They traveled from this world to one beyond, but what they found was pure terror. They return, and these are their true stories. It's very easy to be an atheist when you're successful, but it's very difficult to be an atheist when you're laying on your deathbed. Tonight, renowned cardiologist and author, Dr. Maurice Rawlings, takes you on a journey few have ever spoken of. So I called out into the darkness, Jesus, please save me. And then you can either go to heaven or you'll go to hell and there ain't nothing else. Hear the voice of one that has heard the screams. This may be your only chance to safely go to hell and back. This is an experiment on life after death. All through history, man has predicted life after death. All Bibles are based on life after death. All religions. But where are they? Who's come back to show us there's life after death? But now, through modern resuscitation methods, bringing the heart back, bringing breathing back, you and I can now bring a whole population of people back to talk to us about what's on the other side of death. See what you believe in some of these cases that we're going to present. The good ones are a dime a dozen because people love to tell about this wonderful experience after I died and I came back. The hell experiences are embarrassing. It's an F on the report card, a slap in the face. But we have some cases we're going to present tonight that tell you about their own hell experiences so that you won't go where they went. Now what all this is based upon is teaching you, which we will later in the program, how to restart the heart, restart breathing on someone who has recently clinically died. Notice that death is reversible. You have four minutes survival time of the brain cells without blood flow before rigor mortis sets in, true death sets in, where resurrection is required. Something man can't do. We can do resuscitation, something God has permitted us to do. And how many hell experiences have had salvation on the floor, conversion on the floor, and only remember the good experiences to report? Such was not the case in Ronald Reagan. He had his little boy with him, he was going to a 7-Eleven store, and got in an argument, a bottle was broken, he became stabbed multiple times by his assailant, and then the rest of the story we're going to present to you on film. In 1972, my life was uh, broken. I was uh, a drug addict. I was uh, a criminal. My family was broken. My wife had filed for divorce a couple of times. My children were afraid of me. I really couldn't hold a job. My mental state was terrible. And it was in that uh, frame of life that I took my six-year-old son one night and went down to a little market 
going inside to purchase some things. And on the way in to that market, I met a gentleman coming out the door and an argument erupted. And uh, before I knew it, I had just hit him, knocked him down, and he fell into a, a stack of bottles. The bottles bursted, and uh, immediately he leaped up with a broken bottle and began to stab at me. I lifted my left arm to try to stop the, the blow, and the bottle actually severed the biceps muscle, the uh, major arteries in my arm, and I was bleeding to death in a, just a matter of seconds. But full of anger and hatred and rage, I kept fighting and kept bleeding. My little son was screaming. He was hysterical. But the man that ran the store came over and said, if, if you don't get to a hospital, you'll bleed to death in just a few minutes. So he actually took me in my own automobile to the hospital. And when we entered the emergency room, I was barely conscious. And as the uh, medical attendants began to work on me, I could hear their voices. And I could hear them saying, we can't help him. He'll have to be transported to another hospital. Probably will lose the arm. And as they loaded me into an ambulance, my wife had arrived by that time and got in the ambulance with me. But as they pulled out of the parking lot of that hospital, a young paramedic looked down into my face and I could barely see him, I was so weak. But he said, sir, you need Jesus Christ. And I didn't know Jesus, I didn't know what he was talking about. So my reaction to that was to begin cursing. And uh, again, he stated to me, you need Jesus. And as he was talking to me, it, it appeared like the ambulance literally exploded in flames. I, I thought it had actually blown up. It filled with smoke. And immediately I was moving through that smoke as if through a tunnel. And after some period of time coming out of the smoke and out of the darkness, I began to hear the voices of a multitude of people screaming and groaning and crying. But as I looked down, the sensation was looking down upon a, a, a volcanic opening and seeing fire and smoke and, and people inside of this burning place screaming and crying. They were burning, but they weren't burning up. They weren't being consumed. And then the sensation of moving downward into this. He was thrashing, just thrashing about, you know, and moaning and groaning. And it was like there was a battle going on. I wasn't a Christian at the time, and I didn't even know anything about spiritual battles. But it was scary to me in the fact that I could feel it. I could feel it was like light and darkness. It was like he was fighting against something and I didn't know what but now I know you know it was he was seeing the vision of hell but but the most terrible part of it I began to recognize many of the people that I was seeing in these flames as if a close-up lens on a camera was bringing their faces close to me I could I could see their features and see the agony and the pain and the frustration and a number of them began to call my name and said, Ronnie, don't come to this place. There's no way out. There's no escape. If you come here, there's no way out. And I looked into the faces of, of one that had died in a robbery attempt, who had been shot to death and bled to death on the sidewalk. And I looked in the face of two others that had died drunk in an automobile accident. And I looked into the face of others that had died of drug overdoses that we had partied together and, and the agony and the pain. But I believe the most painful part of it was the loneliness. And the depression was so heavy that there was no hope. There was no escape. 
there was no way out of this place. And the smell was like a sulfur, like an electric welder. And the, the stench was, was terrible. And as I looked at this, I had seen people killed. I had been involved in fights where people were killed. I've done time in prison for manslaughter myself. I grew up basically in a reform school and in a jail cell. I was beat on mercifully as a child by a father that had temper problems and alcohol problems. I was a runaway at 12 years old and I felt like there was nothing in this world that could frighten me. My life was wrecked. My marriage was wrecked. My health was wrecked. But now I'm seeing something that literally scares me to death because I don't understand it. And as I'm looking into this, this pit, this place of fire and screams and, and torment, I just fade out into blackness. And when I open my eyes, I'm in a hospital room in Knoxville, Tennessee. My wife is sitting by. There have been uh, multiple stitches put in my body. My arm was spared. Uh, there were almost a hundred stitches. And I, I looked in the face of my wife. And I wasn't concerned about where I was or anything around me. All I could visualize was what I had just seen. He had this funny look on his face and it was a terrifying look and he said he said I don't really know what's happened to me but he said I've been in a terrible place and I kept telling him you're in the hospital you've, you've been in the hospital all along and he kept saying no he said I've been in another place he said he said I don't know exactly what it was but he said it was terrible it's a terrible place I could still hear the screams. I could still smell the terrible smell. I could still feel the heat. And I could still hear the voices of people that I'd known through the years screaming for me to go back. And through the days to come, I tried every way to get that out of my mind. I tried to get drunk. I could not get drunk. I tried to get stoned. I could not get stoned. I tried everything that I could to get this off my mind and I could not. One morning, several months later, I, I came home to where my wife was. I'd been trying to get drunk. I couldn't. And when I walked in the house, went back to the bedroom, the light was burning. My wife was sitting up in bed and she had a large book open on her lap and she looked up at me and her face was literally shining and she said Ronnie tonight I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior and she didn't have to say a lot to me our life had been filled with with agony she grew up in Chicago her father was a bartender on the south side of Chicago she knew nothing about God or church or religion. And the pain in her face, the wrinkles that I'd put in her face with abuse and violence and alcoholism and drug addiction, being gone for months at a time and her and the kids not knowing where I was, her face had changed. The wrinkles were literally gone. The smile had replaced the sorrow and agony. And she looked at me and she said, Jesus, save me tonight. And she said, would you go with me and hear about this man called Jesus? And I thought for a second and I thought, I've tried everything else in life. Nothing has worked for me. The people that I love most of all, my wife and my children, I'm, I'm terrible to them. And I agreed to go with her. And a couple of weeks later on a Sunday morning, a matter of fact, the date was November the 2nd, 1972. Just before 12 o'clock a.m., a minister stood to, to read from the Bible. I was sitting in the back of the building. I didn't know anything out of the Bible. 
I did not know how to act in church. But the minister stood to read from the Bible. And he read from the Gospel of John. And he began to read these words that said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. When he said the Lamb, he had my attention. It wouldn't have meant anything to me, any other passage. But when he mentioned the Lamb, he had this hard-hearted sinner's attention. Because when I was nine years old, a very poor child in the mountains of eastern Tennessee, with a father that only knew anger and, and abuse and alcohol, a neighbor had given me a baby lamb. And I had to walk two miles to catch the school bus. And coming through her yard, she stopped me one day and said, Son, I have a gift for you. And she showed me this baby lamb. And I took that lamb home with me. It was my friend. The only friend I felt like I had. And it was uh, such a friend in days and weeks to come. It, it followed me and it would, it would meet me when I got off the school bus and came walking through the woods and the fields. One evening as I came in, the lamb was missing. And I heard my father cursing and screaming. And I looked up to the side of the house. And there he was working on on an old model car, changing a flat tar by hand the old way. And I tried to walk around because I didn't want to be cursed. And I tried to, to bypass him. And when I got on the other side of the car, I looked down and there was my lamb with blood all over the white wool and a tar tool sticking in its body. The lamb had come around just wanting to be curious and in a drunken fit of anger and my father had plunged the tire arm through that lamb's body and when I saw my lamb my friend dead I began to scream as a nine-year-old child I run into the woods screaming he's killed my lamb he's killed the lamb and at nine years old Hatred and violence took my life, possessed my life. And from that point, I was never, never, ever the same. By 12 years old, I was a runaway. I was in the juvenile system, arrested time after time after time. There was no respect for authority. I hated anyone that represented authority over me. And by the time I was 15 years old, I had been in jail for car theft, for stealing. And at 15 years old, I was sentenced for manslaughter, involved in a car accident that had taken life and crippled others for life. Wondering at that time if life ever would hold anything for me. But when that minister mentioned the lamb he had my attention and he said Jesus Christ is God's lamb and he died and he shed his blood that whosoever will could have a new start could be forgiven could start over that morning as I stood to try to leave the building I thought I don't want anybody to see me cry I've not cried since I was nine years old I'm not afraid of any living thing on this earth and no one's going to see me cry. But I turned to leave, but I started down the aisle toward the front of that building. And my prayer was this. I didn't know the sinner's prayer. I didn't know the Roman road of salvation. But my prayer was this. God, if you exist, and Jesus if you are God's lamb, please, please kill me or cure me. I don't want to live anymore. I'm not a husband. I'm not a father. I'm no good. And at that instant, 
It was like the darkness and the blackness left my life and the tears began to flow. And for the first time since I was nine years old, the tears did run and the guilt left my life and the violence and the anger and the hatred left my life and Jesus Christ became Lord and Savior of my life that morning. And since that time, I didn't know what would happen, but God healed my mind, my memory, the drug addiction, the alcoholism was instantaneously gone, delivered. And from that moment, I knew that I had to tell the story of what had happened to me. My life was only spared to tell others about the place that I had seen and the hope of Jesus Christ to save mankind from this terrible fate. Here we are again wondering whether hell is for the bad guys or the good guys. I'd like to introduce the subjects O-B-E-N-D-E. -E. You know what clinical death is, where heart stops, breathing stops, and we start life again, restart the breathing in the heart. They come from death back to life, a reversible situation before rigor mortis sets in. Out of the body experiences and near death experiences are entirely different. Near death experience, I hold a gun up at you and say, give me your money. You may get scared to death, but that's a near death experience, but you didn't come anywhere near dying almost near crash auto accident. That's a near death experience, but nothing involving stopping the heart, stopping breathing. And yet uh, most of the authors that write these books are including NDEs and OBEs with clinical death. We're just investigating clinical death where people actually die and come back. Now, out of the body experiences is a way to get there without dying. How'd you like to find out what death feels like without dying? Well, deep hypnosis can get you there. You see a guru over in India and learn the meditation techniques and the correct mantra. Uh, you can have uh, chemical hypnosis. You can go scrying with your crystal ball. Uh, you can have kundalini the electrical stimulus of the coiled snake down the base of the spine, the, the chakral sites and all of the acupuncture is based upon uh, ways of getting out of the body to experience life beyond the body, separating spirit from the body. Uh, this is the definition in the Bible, when the spirit separates from the body, but they're talking about a permanent separation, not a man-made separation. And we, in turn, are talking nothing about NDEs or OBEs. We're talking about clinical death. And this is where the great majority of the people that have true experiences occur. One of the cases we're going to show tonight is uh, Charles McCaig a 57-year-old mail carrier <clears> who <throat> was having chest pain. We took him to the office, put him on a treadmill, and started the treadmill until he got his chest pain again. He was attached to an EKG. The EKG went haywire. We knew he had chest pain. Before we could stop the machine, he dropped dead. Unfortunate. Only one in 5,000 do that, so don't be afraid of EKG stress test. But when he dropped dead, he had a very peculiar situation. Uh, he convulsed like most people do when they first die, and the heart stops applying blood to the brain. Eyes rolled up, sputtered, turned blue, stopped breathing. The nurse started IV. I started external heart massage. The strangest thing happened when I would stop resuscitating to put in a pacemaker. When I came to... Dr. Allen said my hair was literally standing on the end and my eyes had already started dilating. And uh, I was absolutely, uh, just absolutely scared to death. I was horrified. My life was what you might call normal. I partied lots. Not all that bad, but I had joined the church at a small, young age because my parents had said, 
Let's go down to the front and join the church. I really didn't realize what it was to belong to the church or accept Christ until that day. And I had early in one morning at work, I had gone to the walk to the local clinic in my hometown and, tell, and telling them that I thought I was having a heart attack. I didn't tell anyone I was going, and they sent me on up to the clinic where Dr. Rollins was. and kept me about three or four days and then gave me a stress test. On that stress test, I told the girl, Pam, that was running the stress test uh, that uh, I was dying and let me off, and that's the last I remember of that. And uh, when I came to, uh, Dr. Rollins was giving me CPR, and he asked me what was the matter because I was looking so scared and so forth. And uh, I had told him I'd been to hell, I needed help. And he said, well, keep your health to yourself. I'm a doctor, I'm trying to save your life. You need a minister for that. As he was giving me CPR, he was trying to install a pacemaker with the other hand and doing it with one. I would fade out. And then he'd start again and bring me back. I watched what was going on like some people say I was floating in air or up on the ceiling. I was up above it and could look down and see things. And I kept asking, please help me, please help me. I don't want to go back to hell. And Pam said, well, he needs help do something. And at that time, he said, say this short prayer after me. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If you save my soul and keep me alive, I'll be on the hook for you forever. And if I die, please keep me out of hell. And after that, the, the other experiences was real pleasant. I saw my stepmother, my mother. My mother passed away when I was about five months old. I never saw a photograph of her, and I was able to recognize who she was. And my stepmother had passed away approximately 10 years before. They were together. They, they, I did not have any contact physically or mentally with them. All I remember was they kept their hands outreached to me. And I remember later that I made a report that I'd always heard it, but now I knew it. And Dr. Rollins asked me, what did I mean? And I said, well, I've always heard you couldn't carry your money with you. And I looked, and they didn't have pockets. I know that's weird, but I was trying to take in everything I could see. I must have thought I was going to get back so I could tell it. And after I saw them, my next experience was walking down a lane that had colors on both sides, just brilliant colors. I have dabbled in art, and I, or Rembrandt, either one, could not re, re, produce those colors. They were so bright. This light surrounded me, and I believe to this day that was the Holy Spirit that surrounded me and took care of me. And I've never felt so good and so safe in all my life. After all this was over, I realized what had really happened. It was a double conversion. Not only had this make believe prayer converted this atheist on the floor, it had also converted this atheist doctor that it was working on him. That's the only reason I can appear to you here now, to tell you that there is a life after death, and it ain't all good. Most of you viewers out there can tell the difference between simple fainting, clinical death, and biologic death. Charles McKeague, Take that case, for example, who was on the treadmill. I could tell that he was in clinical death. He had a startled question on his face. He was about to ask the question. He looked dumbfounded at me as he's walking on the treadmill. I noticed his heart had stopped, his breathing had stopped, but he was still walking and talking for a minute or two before no brain to the blood flow to the brain registered and he dropped dead. Uh, he was dead and didn't even know it. I should have told him. But what did he do? As soon as we started the clinical uh, death treatment, CPR, we started the heart up again, started breathing again, he came back. This was a case of clinical death. Now, biologic death would have occurred if 
four to six minutes time had intervaled between stoppage of heartbeat supplying the brain and breathing stoppage. After that, brain cells, as the most sensitive cells in the body, start dying. Rigor mortis sets in, meaning stiff as a board, and now we need the resurrection. Only God can do a resurrection. We're doing resuscitation, something we're permitted to do. And now we want to introduce to you Howard Storm, an art and literary professor who was in Paris with his class when he suddenly had a stomach rupture an ulcer rupture, peritonitis, shock, sudden death, clinical death, resuscitation, hell experience. I was a 38-year-old college professor and I taught art and I had taken a group of students and my wife and we had gone around Europe and we had just done a three-week tour and this was the next to the last day and we were in Paris and at 11 o'clock in the morning, I had um, a perforation of my stomach. When this happened, the pain was the most acute pain I'd ever experienced in my life, and it just dropped me right down to the ground. And so I'm twisting and kicking and moaning and screaming and yelling around on the floor. And my wife called an emergency, called the desk, and they called an emergency service. A doctor came and he called an ambulance because he knew what was wrong and they took me about eight miles across town to the public hospital to the general hospital of paris where i was taken into emergency examined by two more doctors who knew exactly what was wrong with me and then they took me away to the surgery hospital which was a couple blocks away and i was parked there because there wasn't any surgeon available to do the surgery and so there I lay for um, eight to ten hours in that hospital with no medication, no examination, no attention whatsoever, awaiting a surgeon to come to give me this operation that was critical. And it's now 8.30 at night. The nurse came in and said that they were very sorry they weren't able to get a doctor for me and they'd get one the next day. Well, when she said that, I knew that it was over for me. I knew that I was dead. The only thing that was keeping me alive was I didn't want to die. I was scared to death of dying because as far as I knew, I was an atheist, non-believer, person who lived for their, the gratification they could get out of the moment. And you know, like dying to me was like the worst I mean, next to the pain, dying was the worst thing that could happen to you because it's the end of life and there was no more, there wasn't anything else. But when she said that, the idea of trying to exist for another minute, another hour in this pain, it wasn't worth it anymore. I'd been hanging on in the hopes that they told me that they'd get a doctor and do the surgery and open me up and, and fix the problem inside of me. But when they said they couldn't get one, so I said to my wife, it's time for us to say goodbye because I'm going to die now. And she got up and she put her arms around me. I'm lying in the bed and she told me how much she loved me and I told her how much I loved her. And this makes me really sad to think about this. And um, we made our goodbyes, you know, said those things that you'd say to the, we'd been married 20 years, say all those kinds of things. I can't tell you because I'll just start crying, but um, she finally sat down because she knew it was over, and I knew, and it was just so hard looking at her crying like that, and I just closed, closed my eyes, just let it go, and I went unconscious. I probably was unconscious for a very short while, a few minutes probably, and I was conscious again. And I looked, opened my eyes and looked, and I was standing up next to my bed. And I knew exactly where I was and what the situation was. I mean, there was no confusion in my mind. I felt um, more alive, more real than I've ever felt in my life. You know, people ask me, you know, were you a ghost? I was, the op I was just the opposite, very alive. As I'm looking around the room, I see that there's 
underneath the sheet on the bed, there's something under the sheet, a body. And so I bent over the bed, the head was turned away from me, and I looked at the face, and it looked like me. But that wasn't possible because I was standing there, I'm alive, I'm great, you know. I mean, I'm more than great, I'm like, you know. And so I tried to talk to my wife. Can't you hear me? And can't you hear me? You know, she couldn't hear me or That's see me. That's not me! But I thought that here? she just was ignoring me. So I got very angry at her for ignoring me, for not paying attention to me. And I'm screaming and yelling at her, what's going on here? Why, why is this body in the bed that looks like me and how to get there and stuff like that? And I had a sneaking suspicion that the body in the bed was me. But I didn't want to think about that because that was too scary. So I'm getting really agitated and upset because this is all too weird. You know, this can't be happening. It's impossible. Um, I've got a hospital gown on, and it's like, really, everything's really real. And I hear people calling me outside the room, and they're saying to me in soft, gentle voices, Howard, you got to come with us now. Come quickly. Come out here. So I go over to the doorway of the room, and there's people out in the hallway, and they're, um, uh, the hallway's dank. It's gray. It's not, it's not light or dark, it's just gray. And they're all in grayness. And they're men and women. And what they're wearing might possibly be hospital uniforms. Um, and I asked them if they were from the doctor to take me to the operation. And I told them, I said, I'm really sick and I'm going to have an operation and I'm going to die if I don't get this operation. And I was supposed to have the operation eight hours ago. And I'm telling them all this stuff. And they're going, well, you know, we know, we know, we understand. Come quickly. You know, you come come quickly. Howard. Howard, come Howard, quickly. Howard, come out here. Howard, come quickly. Come with us. Howard, we've been waiting for you. Waiting. I left the room, which was real, clear, bright, and went into the hallway, which was dank and hazy, and um, followed these people. We had a very long journey. There's no, there's no time, and whenever I make a reference to time, <laughs> it's just an illusion because there was no time in this place. But this journey, if I were to recreate it, I'd have to walk like from Nashville to Louisville or something to, to recreate the, the walk with these people. And as we walked, they stayed around me and kept moving me on, and it kept getting darker and darker. Um, they were becoming more and more openly hostile to me. First, they were sort of syrupy sweet to get me to go with them, and then when I was going along with them, it was like, hurry up, keep moving, you know, shut up, stop asking questions, you know, they started getting more um, ugly. And so we get into complete darkness. And I'm, absolutely terrified because these people are very hostile I don't know where I am I said I'm not going to go with you any further they said um, you're almost there and we started to fight I, just, I was trying to get away from them they were pushing and pulling at me and um, there are now a lot of them what originally had been like a handful now was since it was darkness no one May, hundreds or thousands, I don't, I mean, I have no idea. And they're playing with me. You know, clearly they could have just destroyed me if they wanted to. They didn't want to destroy me. What they wanted to do was they wanted to inflict pain on me because they derived, pleasure isn't the right word, but they derived, derived satisfaction out of the pain that I experienced. So, what they were doing in the beginning part was it's real hard for me to talk about and I don't and I'm not going to tell you much about it just a little bit because um, it gets I mean it just gets too ugly uh, but the, initially they were like tearing and biting um, tearing with their fingernails scratching gouging ripping and then uh, biting trying to defend myself trying to fight them off trying to get away from them but this it's like being um, in a beehive with just hundreds of them all over me and I eventually was just laying on the ground there all ripped up um, 
pain everywhere, inside, outside. And even harder to bear than the physical pain was the emotional pain of what had just happened to me. The utter degradation that I just experienced. You know, I never once felt that it was um, unjust or wrong. I heard my voice. It wasn't somebody else's voice. It wasn't the voice of God or anything. It was my voice. And I heard it speak, but I didn't speak it. So whether it's the voice of my conscience or... I don't know what it was. It was just, but I distinctly heard my voice say, pray to God. And so I thought to myself, I don't believe in God. I pray to God. And I'm thinking, even if I could pray, I don't know how to pray anymore. I haven't prayed. And at that time, I probably hadn't prayed in 22, 23 years. So, and so I'm thinking, like, when, when, when I was a child, and we said prayers in Sunday school, and we said prayers in church, and what did we say? And I'm trying to think of the, I'm trying to think of it because the, to me, to pray was to recite something that I'd learned. That's what, it, that's what I thought a prayer was. Then, so I'm, let's say, the Lord is my shepherd. Um, give us this day our daily bread. My country, tis of thee. No, that's not a prayer. That's wrong. Um, let's see. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, four score and seven years ago, our forefathers. You know, I'm getting all of them mixed up. I can't remember how to pray. And then the people who are around me, if I, every time I'd like mention God, these people who had attacked me and beaten me, every time I mentioned God, it was as if mentioning God was throwing boiling water on them. They would shriek, they would scream, they would yell, and in worse profanity than, than anything I've ever heard in this world. The other thing that was happening was that they, they um, couldn't bear to be around me talking about God. It was, so, it was so painful for them to hear about God that they kept backing away, backing away, backing away. And so I had a sense that I could push them away by talking about God. And so I'm trying to remember prayers, and I'm getting all confused and mixed up, and it was just all um, crazy. And I'm lying there, and eventually I realize that they're gone, and I'm alone. Now, I was alone there for an eternity. And what I mean by that was um, absolutely no sense of time. To, but I thought about my life, thought about what I'd done and what I hadn't done. I thought about the situation that I was in, and this the conclusion that I came to was, is that I had lived an entirely, my adult life, I had lived a selfish life. My only God in my adult life was myself. I realized that I was, um, you know, something terribly, terribly wrong with my life and that the people that attacked me were the same kind of people that I was. They were not monsters, they weren't demons. They were people who had missed it. The, the point of being born and being alive in this world. They had missed it and they had lived lives of selfishness and cruelty. And now we're in a world where there was nothing else. There was nothing but selfishness and cruelty. And they were doomed to inflict that upon each other and upon themselves uh, probably forever and ever and ever and ever without end. Um, and now I was a part of it. And it seemed like, although I didn't want to be there, it seemed like probably the right place for me to be. There was a sense of like, this is what I deserve because this is what I lived. You can't imagine how emotionally painful that was. And I'm lying there for time without end, thinking about my fate. And in the back of my mind comes up an image of myself as a child, sitting in a Sunday school classroom, singing, Jesus loves me. I could hear in my mind, Jesus loves me, la, la, la. Jesus loves me, la, la. And as I recalled myself singing it and heard my, I could hear myself as a child singing it. 
more important than anything else was that I could feel it in my heart that there was a time in my life when I was young and innocent, when I'd believed in something good, when I'd believed in something other than myself, when I believed in someone who was all good, all powerful, who really, really cared about me. And I knew that I wanted that back, that which I had lost, that I'd thrown away, that I'd betrayed. I, want, I wanted that back. That I didn't know Jesus, but I wanted to know Jesus. I didn't know his love, but I wanted to know his love. I didn't, I didn't know if he was real, but I wanted him to be real. You know, I mean, it was, it was all just because I trusted that there was a time in my life that I had believed in something and that um, I knew, I had known once as a child that it was true and I wanted to trust that it was true. So I called out Jesus. into the darkness, Jesus, please save me. And he came. He came. First, there was a tiny little speck of light in the darkness, and very rapidly got bright. And the light became so bright that, um, if it were in this world, it would have uh, it would have consumed me. It, it, it just would have fried me to a crisp. But it wasn't at all hot or dangerous there. The light just came upon me. And he reached down, he was in this light, and he reached down out of this light and gently started to pick me up. And in his light, I could see that I was gore and filth and wounds all over. And was, I looked like roadkill. And he's gently putting his hands underneath me and, and very tenderly picking me up. And as he's touching me, Everything just goes away. All the wounds, all the pain, all the dirt, just it just kind of like um, evaporated away. And I'm like whole and healed. And inside, uh, just filled with his love, which I wish I could be more articulate about. It's so frustrating not being able to tell people about it because you know it's the best thing that ever happened to me in my life I mean it's it's like the it's the everything you know it's the all of, of life is to know that love and you know I get to it and I just can't describe it I can't convey it to you so he's holding me and embracing me rubbing my back like a father would his son like a mother would her daughter just gently rubbing my back and I'm bawling like a baby, out of happiness. I mean, like, the, the, the release, the, you know, having been lost and now been found, having been dead and now brought back to life, you know. And he's carrying me out of there. Up, we just go, out, go on. And we're moving towards a world of light and, uh, I began to have thoughts of tremendous shame that I've been so bad. So I'm, I thought of myself as dirt, garbage, filth. And I thought to myself, he's made a mistake. I don't belong here. He doesn't want me. You know, it's like. The shame of like how could he how could he care about me you know why me um, I'm bad and we stopped we weren't in hell we weren't in heaven we were in between and we stopped and he said we don't make mistakes you belong here and we began to converse and he was talking and telling me things and he brought over some angels and we went over my life from beginning to end and what they wanted to show me in my life was what I had done right and what I had done wrong and without going through my whole life story it was real simple real simple when I had been a loving kind person 
considerate of other people. It made the angels happy, it made Jesus happy, and they let me know that it made God happy. And when I had um, been selfish and manipulative, it made the angels unhappy, it made Jesus unhappy, and they let me know that it made God unhappy. Uh, what they were trying to convey to me, in a nutshell, was my whole purpose of my existence had been to love God, 